will kill the slide. Okay. Welcome everyone to the latest episode of the California Library Association Ursula Meyer Advocacy Fund training series. We have an introductory slide up here, primarily for those of you watching the archive version. So we're going to stop talking long enough for you to absorb that slide. And we're gonna take the slide down and jump right into things. Okay, that's about as much silence as you're gonna get out of us during this session. We're looking forward to a very highly interactive session with a live audience here. For those of you watching the archive version, when we do exercises with them, we would encourage you to freeze the um, recording and engage in that activity for yourself so that by the end of this, you walk away with an action plan, which is the whole thing that we're trying to do here. When we think about social media for advocacy, and we look at it in library settings as well as beyond, one of the first things we do is see what our colleagues are doing in libraries and in other organizations. I'm going to do the counterintuitive thing of instead of focusing at the beginning on a library story, tell you one of the most stunning examples I've seen in the last few years, COVID era, of somebody responding to advocacy in COVID era things and having to go online. Some of you may be familiar with this wonderful operation called the Poor People's Campaign. It picked up where Martin Luther King left off in 1968. A few years ago, a couple of ministers decided that they wanted a new Poor People's Campaign, and so they've organized it to find all kinds of stuff online. They were hoping for a real March on Washington in 2020 to pick up where the one in the 60s had left off. COVID hit, all of a sudden they were faced with the idea of, well, does this mean we have to cancel it? And they were smart enough realizing their sophistication with social media tools and their organizational skills that not only could they go on with their March on Washington, but they could use social media to do something that they wouldn't have thought of if COVID hadn't hit. And that was to arrange a three hour rally online in June of 2020. It was magnificent. They, for weeks, were blasting out information about it on every social media channel they had. They filmed a lot of things in advance that were going to be the, the actual speakers and the activities that they hoped to do in Washington, DC, to encourage people to join that campaign. And by the weekend of the event, they had listed that they would have this virtual rally three different times over that weekend. So it was a taped program with some live interactions there. And you could still to this day, go to the Poor People's Campaign via YouTube and see that rally. I will tell you, I, I was in, involved in it because a friend of mine is involved and I wanted to participate in it. They were so good, it felt like a live rally. It felt like we were all engaged and the time just flew. It was not one of those things where you walked away with Zoom fatigue. They have continued to do things and they actually did a live march on Washington this year to continue the campaign. But what can we learn from that? One, we can learn that no matter what happens to us in our advocacy efforts, if we have the right technology in place and the right people around us to guide us through these challenges, we can do things we hadn't even dreamed about. And while many of us are still admitting straight up and acknowledging the idea that COVID has just been a devastating thing for many of us, we also at the same time want to acknowledge and it has brought to our attention opportunities. And that's what Ezra and I are gonna focus on today. Some of the opportunities we've seen that we've engaged in, that we've enjoyed inside and outside of library land. And this is not gonna be a lecture. The most talking you're gonna see up front like this is my introduction and Ezra's introduction. And we're gonna start getting into content with you. We do want you to unmute, ask questions, keep your cameras on if you're comfortable doing that. We'll monitor the chat so that if you don't have access to an audio um, interface with us here, we'll read those chats into the live recording for the people that are watching it later. So that said, Esra, do you wanna jump in with an overview for what you've seen in COVID and in social media, what we've learned and where we might go with that? Uh, thank you so much, Paul, uh, for this opportunity. Excited to be all of with you today. This is my second, um, you know, participation as part of this workshop series, and I'm really honored to, to really put my second hat that I wear at the Leatherby Libraries at Chapman University, uh, as the chair of the Arts Exhibits and Events Committee, and also the person that kind of manages uh, the marketing strategies and programming. I actually, when I started at Chapman back in 2011. Um, I started um, the first ever marketing, a strategic marketing plan for the libraries. And back in 2011, I have to say marketing was still kind of the dirty word in libraries. People were like, what? Especially academic librarians, maybe the public libraries were a little bit okay with it, but with public librarians, like, what do you mean marketing? Marketing and uh, libraries 
you know, you, we don't market ourselves, right? Uh, so we started, uh, you know, slowly but surely uh, looking at other big academic name libraries um, that have started this work, you know, maybe 20 plus years ago um, and looked at different strategies. And we started, um, you know, the marketing campaign and the marketing strategy. And step by step, it became more than a necessity rather than a luxury. In fact, IFLA, which is the International Federation of Libraries, Association invited me in Ohio back in 2016 to share a poster with that same title called "Is Marketing a, Necess a, a Necessity or um, or a Luxury for Academic Libraries?" I'm just sharing my screen really quick here to kind of show you, um, you know, the 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 article itself, and you can always go back and download it. And here I kind of proved by um, you know using data and using all kinds of materials that we've been working on at the libraries that it is necessary to have a marketing plan for the libraries. Uh, it is not a product, it's a service, but you need to reach out to your students, faculty and staff. And up until now, we're still hearing on campus that students don't know this or don't know that. In fact, just a few minutes before uh, this meeting, we were talking to the Dean about uh, creating a marketing campaign for all the graduate student services on campus. Um, and also one of the other responsibilities uh, that also came along my, you know, as I moved my way up uh, in my responsibilities at Chapman is I was handed also the fundraising efforts. And what I realized is you can't really have a fundraising program unless you have a solid marketing program. Uh, and I also later wrote a paper uh, specifically talking about how in marketing, um, marketing and development go hand in hand in libraries. It was a um, you know, sponsored by Sage Publications. And again, it was um, it was to prove that you cannot have a really solid program, what is, whether it's a liaison librarianship or community development or, or development and fundraising without having a solid marketing plan. So we started to look at our website. So we revamped the website. We started to, law, to look at our blog series and we started to involve not only the librarians, uh, interviewing them, but also our students, uh, which really was a big hit because when the students, that when our student assistants actually know and understand the services that we have in the libraries, they become our ambassadors and our advocates. And having been doing this work for years now, we actually ended up um, winning a case award, um, a gold a gold award in, uh, in regards to one of the series uh, called Exploring the Magic of the Leatherby Libraries, where one of our students went around the building of the, of the libraries and explored pretty much all our rooms, all our services. Um, and he kind of, you know, made it really cool. He, he, he photographed himself, he's a film student, so he photographed himself in different, um, you know, areas of the libraries showcasing the students what we have, the archives, the services, and he and others became advocates of the libraries. So our marketing is definitely, you can't really take a corporate's marketing strategies and just apply it. I mean, I have an MBA, so I, taught, I studied a lot of corporate uh, marketing strategies, but, but you have to kind of tweak it a little bit, use word of mouth, use your students, and also a lot, uh, also really uh, use that liaison librarianship programs and, and have your librarians really be advocates for, for the libraries. Having said that, that was all before COVID. COVID hit us. Thank goodness we had already established a solid um, social media following. We picked only Instagram and Facebook because we're a mid-sized university. We didn't really go into Twitter. Uh, we didn't feel like, uh, according to data, that we needed Twitter. We're still exploring TikTok. We're just a little bit worried about you know, the legality of this. But right now we just, you know what, uh, quality over quantity. Uh, so we stuck to Facebook, we stuck to Instagram and we have a really, really solid blog that doesn't just market some events or services. We have series, we have like, um, you know, explore the knowledge of the Leatherby libraries and our databases. We have interviews with pretty much all the librarians, the Dean. Uh, we have information about upcoming events, upcoming resources. We have our librarians um, also writing blogs for us it, it's a very heavy editorial process because we want to make sure that the information that's out there is, is you know, is correct. But of course, comes COVID, um, that didn't really stop us because instead of just doing everything physically where we had flyers and, you know, physical exhibits and events, 
we shifted all of this and it wasn't an easy shift. You know, our marketing and outreach person that reports to me uh, did a really good job researching uh, around for the best, um, you know, platform. So we picked Scalar to actually work on our virtual exhibits. So we created about two or three of them. Uh, we also decided to, I mean, early in the, during the pandemic, a lot of museums and libraries across the world were doing, you know, libraries from home or museums from home. But, you know, six or seven months um, into the pandemic, everybody pretty much got bored. Uh, we were the one of the longest lasting libraries that have done a Leatherby Libraries from Home post every single day for two for two years. And that's why when we were invited to participate in a, in a case study through Taylor and Francis, it was a success story because uh, I think part of it is it was because of the quality of the posts that we were sharing in additionally also to the consistency. Um, I have to say my colleague, Rachel Karras, who works at UCI right now, did a pretty good job collaborating with other uh, librarians and also with our special collections and archives, uh, pretty much highlighting a lot of the things um, in, in our collections. Uh, we have a really good institutional de depository that had a lot of information about the collections and a lot of photos. So she made sure that, you know, we're, we're kind of crossing the, the T's and the I's and making sure that our, we have no issues with copyright. Additionally, also the Leatherby Libraries uh, administration, which I'm part of, uh, ramped up ramped up all the marketing and promotion. That's why we were definitely pivoted and, and worked on a couple of virtual events. We created a robust marketing platform and we also worked with our cir circulation staff and we still raised money despite of the fact that uh, we were online. So I think part of it is that we just, we wanted to work really hard and we've seen this in academic libraries and public libraries across the world in museums. But, but I think the most important piece and the lesson learned is, is for all of us to continue to be consistent with whatever effort we, we start out there. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it, uh, you know. Thanks, Ezra. So let's make a couple of real obvious connections here right up front. One, Esther's talking about what she did at the university there at Chapman here in, in Southern California. She's talking about being an advocate for those students in trying circumstances. When we think about what advocacy means for all of us, it doesn't necessarily mean we're out on, on the lines marching. It doesn't mean that we're out there calling our legislators every, every hour of the day and night. But activism starts, as a friend of mine said, uh, Maurice Coleman, who does a wonderful podcast called Teas for Training. Maurice made an observation about activism saying, we don't start with the idea of going out and looking for massive changes in the world. There's one little thing that bothers us, whether it's in our library, whether it's in the university we're at, whether it's in another business setting, that thing appeals to us. We go out and we try to do something about it by pulling people together. And these days, of course, COVID has hammered home the idea that pulling people together is as effective online as it is on site. Our challenge, of course, is to become proficient and comfortable with it, to find where our fellow advocates and ad activists are and meet them in those places. So if you jump into the real meat and potatoes of this, let me just quote something that I wrote earlier about social media and how we define it so you don't think it's just Twitter and just LinkedIn and Facebook. Attempting to define social media can be challenging because some tools are clearly part of your social media landscape, while others appear to be designed for and directed toward use in business or other settings. Contributors to Wikipedia suggest that the term, and I'm quoting here, the term encompasses interactive computer-mediated technologies that facilitate the creation or sharing of information, ideas, career interest and other forms of expression via virtual communities and networks. So what we're really talking about is the idea that this puts platforms, including Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Twitter, and YouTube in your social media platform, but it also leaves these business enterprise level platforms such as Slack, uh, and many of the other ones that are out there floating around in a potential gray area, but we're going to consistently include all of that in social media. So as you think today during the session of what we're talking about and what you could do in the future with it, think about that example from the beginning, that wonderful Poor People's Campaign, where they took a live event, took it online, used Facebook as one of its platforms. They also had a couple of other platforms that they broadcast from that recording is still out there on YouTube, that weekend, they reached around 2.5 million people in a virtual rally. 
And that's something that's real eye opener for all of us. We here in California libraries don't have the expectation that we're gonna go out with our advocacy efforts and reach that large an audience. But as we think of how our tools can be integrated with each other, how they can build off of each other, you do something, you film it through what we're doing today here in our Zoom meeting, you put it on YouTube, that expands it, it extends the whole length of that, that process. So let's get to you now. Think about your own social media. Uh, have in the back of your mind, of course, the idea of activism and advocacy. But let's start with a basic question about what social media tools are you using now? Go ahead and put that in a chat or unmute yourself. Talk about what you, what you use and a couple lines about how you're using it. Anybody? If you're watching the archive version, this is that uncomfortable moment when Esther and I will just sit back and leave people going, ah, it's quiet, I'm getting uncomfortable, I need to speak up, otherwise this silence is going to drive me crazy. So somebody in, the, in our cohort of, of advocates here, what are you using and, and what are you doing to reach out? So I'm seeing here in chat, Jenna saying Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, we're doing short info videos with Captain Information on YouTube. And what is the impact you're seeing, Jenna? While she's typing that in, anybody else want to jump in? I will share. So at Inglewood Public Library, we've been using Instagram and Facebook, and we um, just joined TikTok as of about two weeks ago. We have not posted any content just yet, but um, we do have a weekly newsletter as well that goes out via email. So we use these platforms to highlight programs that we um, are hosting, um, as well as um, recaps of events and um, different resources like our database, our online databases or um, our displays, for example, Band Book Week and um, different things like that. Great. Something that remains an issue for a lot of us is when we think about social media, we still very much use it as Ramara is talking about, where we broadcast stuff out, we talk about our events, and we hope people show up. And we forget that the term social media has that all important word social, which implies interaction. And that again is where the Poor People's Campaign and some of what Esra was talking about a little earlier in this session really come into play. It's not just us putting stuff out, but asking the kind of questions that, it, that encourage engagement. When we see a note, we respond to the person that posted the note. We get conversations going. This is how we build the relationships that are all so important in advocacy and, and everything else that we're doing and the, the work we're talking about here as activists. Tomorrow, can you, or Vermar, I'm sorry, I'm messing up your name, just trying to read it off the screen here. Is there a step you take routinely where somebody's responding to an event and you get in touch with them to build a stronger relationship between the library and that person or their organization? Well, since I've been assisting Mirta, who is the uh, libra library assistant for adult services, I'm the library assistant for children's services, I've kind of just stepped into this role. So I have actually responded to some of our patrons on Instagram, just like through the comments and things like that, just creating, like you said, that connection and providing engagement, um, just so it's not a, such a one sided. Um, yeah. Wonderful. And that, that is what we really want to highlight here. We start with social media, putting a message out that we hope is reaching people. And we hope we're hitting them on the platform where they're actually paying attention. But what she's just described is that second step, especially if you're going to be successful in advocacy and activism, it's that creating the relationship that is not just going to be limited to that online platform. It's going to extend beyond that. Before COVID, many of us had the experience of meeting people online occasionally, and then we go to a conference or we'd run into people at some kind of an event and say, ah, nice to finally meet you. And it always sort of bothered me because I think our language was not keeping up with the idea that when we meet people online, we are in a very visceral and important way meeting them. And if we see them face-to-face -face on site as opposed to face-to-face -face online, that's just an extension of the relationship rather than the, oh, good, I finally met that person. And I, I would assume, I'm hoping this is the case for many of you, that during COVID, when you're using Zoom and other platforms, that you had that experience of meeting people for the first time, getting to know them, participating maybe in an American Library Association conference, or maybe even here in some of these sessions we've done, where you interact with colleagues up and down the state 
online so that if and when you're back at a conference like the CLA conference from last June and the one that'll be coming up again next year, that you don't have that feeling, oh, I'm finally meeting you, but in fact, you are meeting them in a different setting, but you're continuing the relationship to develop online. Again, social, that's the heart of it. Esther, do you want to add anything on that topic? I actually want to add a couple of things. One thing you said about CLA, you know, I was, and this is actually how you and I met, I was really honored to participate as part of the CLA leaders cohort this whole last year. And because of COVID, we started the cohort and all the leadership training and everything, and even the projects that we worked on, there was about 41 uh, members of that cohort from across California. And I wasn't really, I mean, we started in October and presented in June and up in Sacramento up in, and up until June, none of us were actually physically met. And I was wondering about like, how can we actually work together without, you know, knowing each other and knowing everything. And what we realize is that we can actually still work together and, and build that, you know, rapport between us, despite the fact that we were virtual. We were extremely successful. There was about seven or eight projects that came out of that, um, you know, cohort uh, group. And, you know, my cohort group had three people. And, and the moment we met, we actually felt that we, we met each other when we knew each other from before. So what we realized is that, you know, meeting virtual did not stop us from, because we made the effort to, we made the effort to get to know each other, others personally, and we were, again, consistent in meeting. So once we started learning about our cohort groups, we, we put, put on the calendar every single Monday, a 15 minutes meeting, whether or not we're going to talk about working together or not, which is kind of socializing, getting to know each other. And it definitely helped us. Uh, getting to know our skill sets and, and everything else we've done. Um, you know, one other thing about events, you said something about let's not put events together and hope that, you know, people will attend. That's a that's a mistake a lot of us, you know, whether in libraries or other, you know, institutions sometimes do. What I do, uh, at least at Chapman, I build the audience before building the event. I make sure, like at least in an academic setting, I make sure that there's a class or two, a faculty or two that are interested in that topic, that are actually invested in me bringing that speaker all the way from another state or another city, paying, getting in the trouble of, you know, putting the event together, whether virtual or um, in person, because it's a lot of work, right? And you want a return on in your investment. And here, the return on in, and the investment is not necessarily money. It's just people in the seats that are an equality people. So if, if I only have 25 students attending, that's great, especially if they're engaged. Even 10, again, especially if they're engaged. And that's a strategy that we started five years ago, and it's been extremely successful because beforehand, we used to just you know, send things on social media. You have to be more targeted when you do these things, um, whether engaged in a specific, with a specific community, a nonprofit, whether you're working in a public, a public library, you have to build your audience before building the event. Because if you, if you build the event thinking that everybody in their cousin is gonna attend, it doesn't really happen. And sometimes it's, you're just preaching to the choir and it's the same people attending the seats. And what we've seen before we started that strategy is that a lot of just library staff uh, were attending. So we're not really reaching the audience that we were hoping for. Um, so that's that's another tip that we started um, working kind of targeted marketing and targeting, targeting people instead of just blasting things on social media and thinking that we're doing a good job. It's all about those people relationships. Going back into the chat and picking up where we left off earlier, Jenna had mentioned what they were doing and I asked what the impact was. So rereading her earlier comment, she'd said they're on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. We're doing a short info video with Captain Information on YouTube. And when I asked what impact it had, her response in chat was the library supports, the library supports it, like, and the board loves it and the community loves it. So we're seeing that whole thing of what Esra's talked about in her paper and what she summarized for you, the blog pieces that are out there, the notes to people advocating on behalf of the students. We're seeing that from Jenna when she talks about using Instagram and YouTube that the community gets into it. And therefore they're building up the kind of group that they need when a real advocacy or activism issue arises and they need that there. Christopher added in that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Google Maps are, are among the tools that they're using. And jumping down there, uh, Jenna added in that they do they did info videos with the Library Foundation. Again, I want, want to emphasize to you, you do this event, you do these videos, 
And it changes the nature of the conversation and the nature of creating the collaborations that we need to make activism and act advocacy work. There's a highly technical paper that came out about 10 years ago online, and I'm not even gonna bother citing it because the name is so long, it'll take about a half hour of this. But the point of these two scholars who wrote the paper was that conversation well before COVID hit us, conversation was changing as a result of how we interact online. In a normal conversation, if we're face-to-face -face on site, I say something, you say something. I say another thing, you say another thing, if the conversation's flowing adequately. Online, oftentimes the same thing happens in a live session like this, and then we think it's over, but it's not. If somebody else is watching this archive version, maybe you're that person watching it right now saying, oh yeah, he's talking to me. You see something you like, and there's somebody in this group, either Esra or me or somebody else who says something in the course of the conversation that appeals to you, whether you see that a day, a week, a month, or a year after we actually had this live conversation, you continue that conversation by reaching out by email or Twitter or LinkedIn or any other social media tool. And a lot of us are pretty accessible online. So something like this, it's not impossible for us to say something today and get feedback six months or a year from now. That conversation could spark something. So the point of that scholarly paper, and the point I wanna make here is we need to realize that our conversations can, can extend over very long moments. I do this now, somebody else does it, respond six months from now, I get around to responding to them eight months from now. That's a momentary conversation that extend, extended in social media time over a very much longer period of time, but it is capable of producing results. If we are aware of that, and if we use that to our advantage, we have created advocacy and activism tools far richer and deeper than anything we would have imagined before we started using things like Skype and Zoom, Google Chat, and all the other things that we have out there. The same thing goes for Twitter. I tweet something out, immediately a few people may respond if I'm lucky, but the real life of that is when somebody else retweets that and gets to somebody I don't know. That extends the reach of that conversation. And if that person is touched by what I said in a positive way and wants to reach out and work with me and with the groups that I represent, then our advocacy has become so much richer as a result of that. So again, the real thought here without getting overly scholarly about it is think in terms of what conversation means in the year 2022. Think of what we've learned in this awful pandemic about communicating with each other, even though we are not in the same offices, oftentimes not in the same cities, but the communication tools we have, and then ask yourself the killer question, how can I more effectively use those tools to promote the causes that are so near and dear to my heart? Looking back at chat, uh, other people have been responding with the things they're using. Tyler saying Instagram, pictures, video, Twitter, microblog, constant interaction on Facebook, pictures, story time recordings during COVID. Story times have been a wonderful thing. I saw that here in San Francisco, where instead of just having the usual librarians reading things, they got very sophisticated and very creative in starting the story time online in the early phase of the pandemic. Our city librarian actually did one of the story times. Our mayor did another one of the story times. And don't tell me that that doesn't have an impact. If parents are suddenly seeing the mayor and the head of the library and other people that they know around the city doing their story time, it invites them to be part of that community too and respond with something as simple as a like on the YouTube video when they watch it or reaching out with a note to the city librarian or to the mayor or somebody else saying, really appreciated that. And again, it starts to grease the wheels for conversations that might not have happened. Can't say it enough, social. It really takes us somewhere. David says at OCPL, we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, attempting to secure TikTok, but lots of red tape and again, don't be beaten down by that. We all know that there are good reasons for making things, making us really think through how we're gonna be using social media tools. If we jump in and we're not prepped for it, we can really create some, some mistakes and some problems for ourselves. So we have to be thoughtful about it. But at the same time, we have to be thoughtfully adventurous and use them in ways that work for us. I love what David's saying about here. We use these for programs and service awareness as well as community engagement. There we're back to it community engagement and enrichment with passive programming. Christopher added in used to provide children's story time via Facebook and a trivia quiz via Zoom. And there you go, another part of what makes social media so impactful in advocacy and activism. It's engaging and it can have a sense of humor. If we use these judiciously and to our advantage, 
we show the human side of ourselves and we draw people in. Celeste has a similar comment about Instagram, Facebook, dabbling into TikTok, but still don't have content yet, as well as a monthly newsletter. Most of the platforms are used for photo and information about services and programs. But since I've recently joined the librarian team, I'm trying to advocate for other ways to expand our reach and other platforms. So here we're starting to see the real impact of using the social media that we have explored more deeply as a result of COVID forcing that on us, seeing the impact it brings, not forgetting that there's real people behind it. We're reaching out to people in our communities and beyond our normal communities, our familiar communities to create more diverse outreach efforts, to create more diverse communities of action, and as a result, to make our communities a little bit stronger, a little bit better. Again, Esra, anything you want to add on that? I mean, you, you mentioned the word diverse. I mean, and I, one of the things that I had at the Chapman University Libraries is the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Um, and I also, that's one thing that helps with marketing is that because we work with a lot of diverse communities across the county, uh, we've been extremely successful. I can't, again, and I saw that comment on uh, in the chat, building our audience and make it, make it beneficial to our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within the university itself. One example comes to mind is, is our collaboration with the Sikh Indian community. We have a large uh, Sikh Indian community with a, a, you know, a lot of houses of worship, um, and we collaborate them uh, with them uh, yearly on a film festival, a yearly exhibit. Um, that's kind of, this, this is where I also put my development um, hat and, uh, and fundraising hat. So I help raise the funds, create the audience, and then create an event that will not necessarily just help the community, but also help the students and the faculty. Um, so I know it's a lot of legs and a lot of elements to manage. Um, that's why a lot of the marketing and events efforts really needs a lot of um, you know a lot of staff. That's why we depend on students all the time, specifically when it comes to marketing, because students and sometimes you know younger teens and and kids want to see themselves. So if you have volunteers in your public libraries, use, use those students and young volunteers to be your advocates within your city because they're the ones that, that you know, that are going to go out and be ambassadors for your programs as well. Ashley, right, so you're ready to leave the first discussion that we had planned here about more effectively using social media tools? So more, more effectively using social media tools, I mean, going back to, to again, using the younger generation. Uh, so we, we just created, for example, our first TikTok video. We ended up uploading it on YouTube, but it was created by two students um, because not all, not all the librarians and library staff are actually comfortable doing TikTok videos. I know some are, um, but some really just don't want to do that. So just use your volunteers and they're actually much better than all of us in all that stuff. So, um, and to be honest, sometimes it's not the best tool. So TikTok is not the best tool for everything because sometimes it kind of waters out, waters down the value of the library. Um, so sometimes it's a good idea and sometimes it's not a good idea to use TikTok. So kind of pick your battles there. Um, and same with Facebook. I mean, Facebook for me, it's, it's more of a branding uh, platform. You kind of have to be on Facebook because this is pretty much, and Instagram too, this is pretty much where people go to kind of check what's, what's going on. Um, but, but don't have a Facebook and Instagram and don't post anything about it because one, one thing library leaders and library staff members and librarians need to know is that social managing social media is actually work. You have to be really qualified to do this. You can't just add it to somebody's job. You can't just assume that someone is doing it and then nobody's doing it. You have to really follow thoroughly because sometimes it could hurt you. Because if you have like a, if you're managing a small city library and you, someone, you know, two years ago started that Instagram page and then, um, you know, there's that, you know, young, young teenager that's looking on the Instagram page and nobody has posted for the last 16 months that actually is hurting you rather than helping you. Um, and, and people need to understand that social media work, like you have to actually get, I think a lot of people, um, cause I, I hire all the time for social media on, on outreach and marketing. And a lot of, I hire a lot of people, like my last assistant had a PhD. She's the one that co-wrote that paper with me. Um, she, cause you have to have really, really good writing skills. You also have to be, uh, to, to use your professional judgment as you actually engage with the audience on social media. Cause sometimes, 
especially as we started working on um, and promoting some of our diversity efforts, you can imagine the backlash. Um, not a lot, but you, you get members of the community sometimes or maybe the institution that don't like what we're doing. Um, so you have to be smart enough and also eloquent enough to be able to, um, you know, because the library, whether it's public or academic, it's for everyone. So you have to be um, you know, neutral and as well, uh, in, in, a, in a way that appeals to all members of the society. So you can't really take sides and you have to respond or sometimes block some members of the public that are, you know, being out of line sometimes. So again, the first, uh, if we're talking social media purely, you have to, like library leaders and library program managers need to understand that social media is actually work and you have to hire a professional to do that kind of work or if it's part of their job that they need, you need to allocate specific amount of time and you have to supervise the posts, you have to look at it and you have to be consistent. Maybe it's once a week, then it's once a week, but you have to be consistent about it. Thanks. Now let's get a real for the people that are here. First step towards you having something actionable by the end of the session today. Question for you, what can you do based on what we've been talking about so far to more effectively use social media tools and platforms in your advocacy efforts? And the question is, what can you do with the tools you have to be more effective in advocacy? Anybody? If you're doing this at home, watching an archived version of this, please make some notes for yourself so you have your action plan starting to develop. Any volunteers to tackle that one? Could you repeat the question one more time, please? Absolutely. Based on what you've heard here, what can you do to make your advocacy efforts using social media more effective? You're starting to develop your action plan with that question. Well, for me at my library, I, I've been here for a month now and the social media posting we post frequently, but there's not an overall um, consistency or like branding, like it's just kind of here and there and different weird things and there's not like a, a plan of uh, of action so I think my first step would just be creating a plan of action of like who are we who are we talking to through these posts what do we expect to get out of these posts um, when we do our captain info video who are we doing this for how are we letting people know that we're doing it um, so just getting a better sense on that and um, there's not like a social media team here either. It's just like some people do some stuff. Um, so it's kind of just, it's just not um, tightened and lined up. Great. So the first thing I'm hearing from you is get some kind of an action plan there. The second thing is start focusing more on how those messages are getting out. And the underlying question, Jenna, to ask yourself and anybody else who's of that same frame of mind is, do you actually know where your users are? Are they primarily on Facebook? Are they on uh, Snapchat? Are they on LinkedIn for some reason? If you know that's where they are and you're using a different platform, then it's, it's part of that plan to say, we need to get better at that. And we need to have people that are really comfortable already in those platforms to work with us. Never, by the way, when you're working in libraries, overlook the idea that you have wonderful community volunteers that are probably very good at this and are willing to help you under the right guidance. So you do have resources, even if you're pulling your hair out and saying, I don't know how to do this. I don't even know where to start. You know, look to colleagues, look to volunteers, look to friends, get some advice from people that are your actual library users just by asking them, what do you use? Where do you go for your information in social media? What do you really like looking at? Anybody else, things that you can do based on what you already have in place to be better advocates via social media for the causes that, that you're promoting. See one comment here from Christopher in the chat, trying to post regularly to build channels, enforce some consistency. And that's great. He's got some in parentheses, enforce some consistency. Better use uh, Loomly, which I'm not familiar with, or other social media management tools. Absolutely, the social media management tools out there are just fantastic. There are some of these tools that will allow you to schedule the uh, actual 
flowing out of comments so that if you're taking a business trip or if you know you're going to be in meetings at a time when you want posts to go out, you can use us to put the messages out in a timely fashion. But what we're hearing from a couple of you at least saying what you can do to be better at this is look for a plan, have your resources clearly identified to you, know where people are, and do your best to reach out to them in a fairly regular way so they know where to look for you and when to watch for you. Let's open this up for questions. We've thrown a lot at you. What questions do you have at this point in this conversation about the use of social media for advocacy and activism? Anybody? I think everybody needs a second or third cup of coffee. I guess going off of um, what Ezra said earlier about the younger generation maybe knowing TikTok better, for public libraries, does anyone have like a teen advisory council? And have you ever given like your social media over to them for a day? Because I've seen that on other accounts where they've let someone be a guest in charge of it all day. Um, so has anybody done something like that? We don't have a TikTok at our library, so it would have to be like taking over our Instagram. So at um, Inglewood Library, we do have a teen advisory board that focuses on um, like college readiness and other aspects of that nature. Um, we have not tried anything like that yet, but I would be um, interested to see, you know, what that looks like in our library, um, because we do have a pretty active group of teens that come every Tuesday. So um, I'm glad that you brought that up because I believe um, if I talk about it, you know, with my colleagues that it could, you know, bring an interesting um, conversation. Okay, I left that period of silence there because I wanted you to, to think about what just happened here. We're using Zoom, talking about advocacy. So this is our social media tool, our primary one for the day. What we finally got to was a point where Esther and I stepped back long enough for a couple of you in the call to use that same social media tool to start to establish connections with each other and share ideas that go beyond what Esra and I may be able to add. And this is an important part of using social media and advocacy or anything else. As a facilitator of these tools, you need to go in with some sort of an action plan so you know the meeting's gonna keep running well and that you're going to get where you need to get. You have your goals and objectives written out in front and you know what you want to end with. But in the meantime, part of this is expediting communication between others. And I wouldn't normally be this explicit in it, but I want you to walk away with some of the things that Esra and I have picked up here. If Ramara and Jenna at this point were to use the private chat function that nobody else can see and say, hey, this is great, I wanna to talk to you later and exchange email addresses, we've accomplished one of the little things that makes advocacy and activism work in a social media setting. And that is that people meet each other, they establish those connections and those of us facilitating these connections need to know enough to when to step back and let a little bit of silence there so those connections grow rather than everybody looking back at us to be the only ones that are facilitating and making those connections. I hope that, that this will result in Jenna and Ramara talking after this and others of you that may be of a like mind say, well, I don't really want to be recorded saying that I'm interested in this, but I'd like to follow it up. Remember that the tool offers you that wonderful level of privacy where you can reach out to somebody and say, here's my email address, here's my phone number, you can use it. Whereas you might not want to put that in an open chat that might be duplicated somewhere else and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of people calling you. Let us address the whole idea of how do you protect yourself against the trolls who sometimes interject themselves into these things, especially if what you're an activist or an advocate for is a controversial issue. My big advice from the best colleagues that I have out there is do not feed the trolls and protect yourself. Somebody starts to troll you, which in plain language, of course, is they're being nasty to you online. They're just harassing you. They're trying to taunt you. A, ignore them if it's a feasible thing to do. Now, if they are taking down your institution, you need to get somebody else to come in. And Patrick Sweeney, who's with every library and we've had it in part of this series before, talks about the idea of sometimes you don't want to be the one to respond to the troll. If you have a colleague that can do that for you, 
then that gets you out of the argument and it sort of diffuses them because the troll is actually feeding off whatever reaction they get from you. So they say something about you in a public setting, somebody else steps in and defends you in a very nice way, very briefly, that removes you from it and lets you go on and do other work. And in the worst, worst, worst situations I've seen, people that I've been lucky enough to meet through the Black Lives Matter movement, when things got really bad for them through trolling, they actually had friends that they trusted look at their Twitter accounts and look at their Facebook accounts before they logged in in the morning. And their friends would just delete the garbage so that they weren't subjected to it. So if it really gets bad in social media and you need to protect yourself, step back, take a breath, get some trusted people to be your filters and don't let yourself be drawn into the arguments. But in the, the more common and best of situations, in a setting like this where there's a certain level of privacy and safety, take advantage of that. And as a facilitator, when you're using the tools, be aware of what those, those options are and point them out to your audience so they can use them too. Questions or comments on that? That covered a lot. Um, I actually just, one that just popped into mind because you were mentioning trolls. Yes. And, and it wasn't actually trolling, but um, I would say we, you know, I mentioned the Google Maps that we have a business account on Google. Um, I also check Yelp. You can't really advertise on it, but if your hours are out of date, people will really get mad at you and start giving you horrible ratings. Um, so there's things like Google Maps. Um, check also um, Apple. I think it has Maps. There's another one from Microsoft. It's kind of they're kind of a nuisance to keep up to date because they don't play well with each other sometimes. Actually. Uh, I think Microsoft will actually pull everything across from your Google listing. So, and I've actually found like with Google mentioning it, that people um, check there a lot, that they get a lot of their what's going on. It's that advertising things on it actually is good. Um, the other one that I actually created is LinkedIn or not LinkedIn. I mean, uh, um, uh, Nextdoor. Um, and I bring that up because I, I don't know how people, what their experience has been, but it always seems like there's trolls <laughs> or a lot of negativity in LinkedIn, or I mean, in Nextdoor. And so really, um, we we did, we have ourselves on there and we have our listings, which are, but also just check what's going on and what's being said about your institution. Sometimes we had something where um, a patron someone came in and a guy was basically exposing himself to her um, where we couldn't see it. And, you know, of course, if we had walked by, he wouldn't, he wasn't targeting us basically. So we wouldn't have seen it anyways, but, and she happened to take video of it and it got posted on next door. Um, and, it, you know, we heard from the mayor and we heard from the city manager. And so there's a lot of um, sometimes just, you're going to find things that happened at your institution that nobody bothered to report to you. Thankfully she did tell us. So we did know about this, but it's sometimes things will come up and somebody will start saying, Oh, go there. And you, sometimes you just have to go in and say, you know, no, we don't provide that. Or yes, we do come on in. And so. Chris has made several really great points here that are well worth highlighting in kind of a bullet form here, bullet point form. First one is, do check those sites out there. Look at what people are saying about you on Yelp. Look at what people are saying about you on Facebook. It's pretty simple to go in and put in the name of your library in Facebook and see what comes up. If there are positive comments, that's an opportunity. Respond to those. If you go into Yelp, you might be surprised to find a bunch of people have said nice things. And if you just go in and put a like on it or send something back saying, hey, thanks a lot. Hope to see you next time you're at the branch or next time you're at our main building or whatever you're hoping to encounter with them. That again, starts to build up those relationships. Next door, uh, again, per total opinion here. This is not a well-researched thing, but it's based on the experience I've had. For those of you that don't know Next Door, it's a, a potentially wonderful tool that limits users by a zip code or by a neighborhood so that in theory, you can talk to your neighbors online and talk about things of importance to you. When I first heard about it and I heard somebody from Next Door online talking about it, I thought it was fabulous. So I jumped into one from my own neighborhood. And about a month later, if I'd had hair, I would have pulled it as I ran out of the room screaming. Because I experienced, I think what Christopher's talking about, where most of the things in my neighborhood, um, next door block or, or room, 
were criticisms of people just ripping each other apart and talking about crime rates. Uh, if that was my sole source of information, I would lock myself in my house and get a shotgun thing I needed to protect myself. So I'm not a big fan, unfortunately, of next door. I love the idea of getting people together online by neighborhood. But from what I've seen in a few neighborhoods, my own and from what colleagues have told me, Unfortunately, the kind of people that tend to go into next door in those neighborhoods have been the ones that are, are looking for a place to whine and to start arguments. So I'm not a huge fan of it. And I'm sorry to say that because I think it's the potential for it is tremendous. I'm sorry it's played out the way it, it has. Anybody want to add anything? Have you had different experiences with next door in your own service area that that would make it a usable thing for you? Kind of sad either people aren't familiar with it or else nobody's had a positive experience and again what a shame see this is where we go wrong i think with social media we see the the rude tweets that are out there and we think, okay twitter is a garbage can we see next door where people are yelling at each other okay so people can't even communicate at that level and yet it's the people that gravitate toward those specific tools and the lack of good facilitation and that's where I really want to emphasize this. I know the guy in my neighborhood that facilitates things. And I would pull him aside when I see him at the local coffee shop and say, why do you put up with that? And he would say, well, I can't really control it. And my question to him, which never got a good answer was, you're the facilitator. You're the guy that's in charge of this. Why do you not set some ground rules and stick by them? For those of you that have been around Library Land for a while, you might remember Sarah Houghton Jan, who for the longest time had a really funny and great column, Librarian in Black, on her blog. And she would always talk about the different things that went on out there. She made it clear on her site if you were going to respond to her blog, here were the rules of engagement. And if you violated these, you were out of there. And I would look at my guy in, in uh, next door neighbor, in next door, and say, you have community standards. You are within your rights to, to enforce those, but he wouldn't. Can you imagine having your rules of behavior in your library, posting them, and then somebody breaks the first one and you go, oh, I can't enforce them. I just can't do that. That's how nonsensical this is. And yet, that's what some of our online facilitators do. Ash, for your experience in that area? Well, um, it's, you know, again, we're an academic institution, so it's a little bit different you know, when it comes to, when it comes to these things. So I can't, uh, I, I'm not really sure if I can, uh, you know, speak, speak to that as, as much. Any questions from anybody else or any observations you've had? We've sort of moved ourselves into the, all right, we're trying to reach out to people and be social, but sometimes they're not playing nice back. Anything you want to pursue in that theme before we move on? Sometimes, you know, um, of ratings on Facebook or on um, any of the others, I find it it can be nice to one, you know, like throw a thumbs up to somebody who gives you a nice review or just say, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Or um, I've had people who've le left more mixed reviews and I've sometimes said, I'm sorry you had that experience. I hope, you know, and what sometimes if I know that like they were complaining that we didn't have our good hours and it was pandemic it was kind of like well you know we can't go that fast we can't open everything up at once and explain what our timeline was um and then others you know i've had something where they said something negative and i did leave a response explaining what what our policy was but really honestly i wasn't addressing that person i was addressing anyone else who would read the response so i it's not it wasn't trolling but I think there's sometimes where you have to recognize that person's lost. It's not worth arguing with them about was this good or bad. But also, you know, sometimes you have to speak to the broader audience too. That's absolutely something to keep in mind. And it goes back to the whole thing of what is conversation in the 21st century with social media? It's no longer I say something, you say something, and then we leave the room and it's over. That extends, and you're right, you're responding to that person as well as anybody who sees it. So the conversation is a much more open thing, and you, you really have no idea how far those ripples extend, but you do need to respond so that you don't get creamed. Absolutely great points to be making. Anyone else? Well, I just put also, so the Chapman University uh, branding guidelines has like a commenting guidelines that kind of helps us when you know things of that sort happen. So I kind of put the link that could also be helpful to others um, that are in, uh, in this workshop. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. 
All right, I think we have pretty much beaten to death the idea of the introduction here and deciding where our platforms are and trying to make sure that we protect ourselves and our institutions. And again, as advocates and activists, how to reach out to people in positive ways and not get sucked down by the people that may be our opponents in a particular thing for which we are advocating. Esther and I did plan on doing a little bit around the idea of case studies, and we pretty much kind of covered that already in this first part. Esther talked about what she and her colleagues did at Chapman to be advocates for their students during COVID. I mentioned to you the whole thing that was going on with the Poor People's Campaign and how a simple virtual, well, not really simple, but a virtual rally took on a life that still extends to this day for anybody that wants to see it and adds to their ongoing advocacy efforts. I want to draw this back with just one case study for this particular session and talk about California Library Association in and of itself. Simple mandate here, this series that you're, you're participating in, the Ursula Meyer training series, there was a bequest left from uh, to CLA to have this kind of a series going. And we had a lot of conversation up front when they finally hired me on as a consultant to actually roll it out with people uh, with a variety of, of participants here. The question in the middle of COVID, of course, was, are we going to do this online and we're going to do it face to face or how is this going to roll out? And in the initial designing, when we were early in COVID, nobody knew how long COVID would be lasting and affecting us. So we just planned it as broadly as we could so that it could be implemented either face to face on site or face to face online with something like Zoom or even a hybrid version where maybe we would have some on site meetings face to face that could be broadcast live and have interaction. The way it played out, of course, is COVID dictated that we stay with the online sessions, but we've tied it back to some of our online things. And Esther mentioned this earlier, we had already been doing some of the series. I think we had done the four pilot episodes when I saw Esther, and we were working well into this year's sessions once a month. When I went to CLA on site and heard Esther and her, her colleagues, I thought, the things they're saying are so applicable to our series. We need to build something around the session they just did, but not just duplicate it. So that was a great example of CLA starting online with this series, but by having me and Karen, who's here with us today through CLA programs and a few other people on site, we were going to different rooms, hearing things, meeting people and drawing them back in so that we can eventually move to that thing of in the best of all situations. So gatherings in a physical single room that could be broadcast out and bring an audience in. It's not that hard to do. I've been doing this since about 2008. When we first tried something with Skype at San Francisco Public Library, we brought in a librarian from Ohio University's libraries via Skype to tell us how they were using Skype as a reference tool. So she came into our auditorium via Skype. She was on a big screen. And within the first few minutes, exactly what we hoped would happen, happened. People forgot she wasn't physically in the room because they were engaging with her. She could see them, we could see her, they could hear her, she could hear us. And the conversation was just stunningly wonderful. It just takes practice. So if you're looking at this and saying, I can't pull that off, that's beyond me. Talk to people that have done it. Talk to Esther, talk to me, talk to your colleagues who have up and down the state and across the country been doing this for a good long time using free technology and the tools we have. It doesn't need to be a barrier to having social media be part of your advocacy plan. And again, circling back to the thing I keep talking about, we do what I learned from the Poor People's Campaign. Once we have these sessions, Karen pops them up onto the CLA YouTube channel as quickly as she can. And if you know anything about YouTube and doing live sessions, you know that if you've done this right, you're going to have far more participants over a long time viewing that session online in an archive version than in a live session. Does that mean one is more important than the other? Absolutely not. What it does mean is we are rethinking what it means to do training sessions, what it means to have conversations, what it means to actually activate your activists and your advocates. And you use every tool you can without driving yourself crazy. You figure out what you have the resources to do, you focus on that. If you have an hour a week, then you're going to put that hour a week into the thing that's most uh, stunningly successful for you. If you have the kind of staff and the kind of support that allows you to do several hours a week of stuff, just putting tweets out, putting LinkedIn notes out, putting TikTok videos out, you go for that. But the, the primary thing is get the biggest bang for your buck in the least amount of time you can and be consistent about it. And that's something many of you are feeding back. That's where I see you putting some chats and uh, some comments in. Why don't you go ahead and address those? Yeah, I was just putting some, uh, again, it came to my mind when you were talking about look at what other people are doing. Uh, one of my motos in life is don't reinvent the wheel. 
there's a lot of stuff out there. And the reason we, we decided to uh, use Scalar as part of as, as our virtual exhibit platform is some of the our peer institutions were actually already using it. And it was just a pretty much an email. We reached a couple of people from USC and other universities or other local universities. And everybody really, I mean, again, we are in the information sciences profession. We're all library staff and librarians. So we all like to share information when, and we get excited about being asked to, to share information. So uh, there's absolutely no way that you're going to send someone an email saying, I saw that you did this and they're going to say no. They're actually going to be more than happy to either meet with you or email you back about the process. And um, again, as library people, we were organizers. So we have like a process and procedure in place. We all like to share information. So instead of re in trying to, to, building some, to build something from scratch, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Look at what other people are doing out there. One of the things that I start my staff, uh, whether they're full-time staff members or students, is that I have them spend a week or two about, at other libraries um, local and uh, public and academic and see what they're doing because uh, you know you get inspired and you don't have to copy paste there's absolutely no way you can copy paste the program you can copy an idea and put your twist and touch on it um, and make it your own so there's absolutely no problem with that I mean a lot of the times we actually give credit um, to the program that we're actually modeling that for you like for example we created a fellowship um, during COVID, and the fellowship was modeled after a fellowship that's created um, at Johns Hopkins University. So we gave them credit. There's no problem with that. Actually, it makes you even more credible because you're following the foots of, you know, big name universities and, and, and public libraries as, as well. So so my advice is don't don't reinvent the wheel. There's a wheel out there. Just, you know, just you know, be part of it and be innovative. Another for what I assume for most of you will be an unexpected moment of interaction here. We've gone almost an hour here and I'm hoping that it didn't feel like an hour. You go, wow, we've gone through a whole hour already. We wanna give you the, the chance to tell us, do you need about a five minute break so that you can breathe, get up, get a cup of coffee or tea or something and then come back and do a final set of exercises or shall we just keep going? So the question to answer in chat with a yes or no, should we take a break now? Those of you watching the archive version, you can vote too, although we won't see your answer. We're just sorry about that. Yeah, we can just continue. Okay, so I'm seeing no preference. Just continue. Anybody else with an opinion? I'd say continue and leave early. <laughs> okay, yes. leave early? You think we're going to do that? Okay. <laughs> All right, so the final thing we want to do is now using what you've learned and actually walk away with a solid action plan. So we're going to do a couple of things. I'm putting in the chat some directions that tell you what we'd like you to think about. I'm also going to see if I can share my screen in a way that gets that document visible to you. So give me a second, see if I can pull this off. And of course, I just totally blew it by shrinking my whole screen down. So that didn't work. Let's try plan B, sharing screen. Here we go. All right, reality check. Are you seeing you're actually seeing a slide deck there because somehow my Zoom window is not up at full speed. All right, if this doesn't work, we're gonna forget about that. Actually, are you seeing on the left side of your screen the exercise for participants? Is that coming through yet? Okay, I'm gonna make that full screen. I can see it. Beautiful, there are the instructions. Let's take a few minutes. Karen, let's go ahead, as soon as I finish giving these instructions, let's stop the recording so people don't just watch us working for five or 10 minutes while we're doing the exercise. But there's the exercise. If you're watching the archive version, freeze your screen now so you got the directions. Those of you that are in the live session, we'll keep that up for a few minutes. Work through that. And when you have finished working through that, uh, unmute yourself and say, I'm done, or put something in chat. And I'll try to keep the chat window for myself too so that we can watch out. Let's take about five minutes to take to do this exercise and then debrief it together. Karen, go ahead and freeze or pause. All right, for those of you that just saw the blip of turning off, turning on, we had about five minutes where people did the exercise and we're now going to uh, do a quick debrief of it. Anybody want to put their own first draft plan out there so that we can hear what you're up to and offer you some constructive comments about it to um, help you to hone that before we leave today. 
Any volunteers? I can go ahead and start. Um, Thanks so much. Something that, yeah, no problem. Um, something that I've been kind of considering is we already have Instagram and we utilize it mostly for uh, pictures, graphic content, um, sometimes like live people, but um, but we never use the real content of it, the real tools. Um, I've been kind of all over social media myself and have realized that the algorithm has really been pushing out that content because it's so similar to TikTok. And, you know, a lot of the social media feed off of the same type of uh, tools and, and a few second videos, few second um, reels. So I kind of wanted to use, utilize that tool in a sense to reach more people. Um, so that would be, require another thing with that tool is like you can collaborate more with staff and you can also collaborate with your you know, your partnerships and the people that you're doing a program with, and you can create that reel together in a sense. And it's also another way of promoting and making it a little more fun. Um, I think it also um, is a way to kind of, I had written here, hold on, I'm going through my three sentences. Um, I think it also allows for if people are consenting to wanting to be a part of, you know, patrons in that video it can it kind of brings them as well into it so it also creates that community engagement and um something that i kind of hope to get from this is also like you see engagement growth within the content of instagram and not only that but in other platforms because then it reaches you know our website it reaches like clicking on the program we do get statistics on who clicks on our website and who goes where so that's something that we can see in that way and then also just more shares and attendance to a lot of those programs that we are promoting on there that's a wonderful start in training we often want to make sure that what we're doing is actionable and measurable so some questions for you to answer quickly off the top of your head and then go back and fine tune this you roughly since you mentioned you look at the staff now you probably know how many people are interacting with you at this point on that platform what would be the goal of increase that you would want to see? Let's, with a simple example, say you've got 100 people a month interacting with you now. Would you want to see 200? But let's put these in your terms. What kind of increase do you want to see? I would say just, yeah, like if I were to say 100 people, I would want to see an increase in 200. But not only that, I think it's also the community that I'm reaching, seeing more of, we have a very, predominantly strong um, immigrant Spanish speaking community. We're in a rural town. Um, a lot of them um, aren't aware of our services. So getting that word of mouth and have and seeing the, um, that community come in and speak to us and seeing an increase in that is something that I am actually really valuing. So that's another way of utilizing reels is being able to kind of push out content in Spanish. And then it kind of the language itself is getting um, getting to those um, that community as well. So that's something else that I'm seeking out. Great. So to tie the, the ribbon on this particular package here, in your plan as you develop it a little bit further, have a specific number in there, a number of people you want. Mention that ethnic diversity part. How many more people do you want to have from that ethnic group than you have now so that you can measure this at the end and see if you were successful? This is not so that you beat yourself up at the end and say, oh, I wanted another 50 uh, members of our Latino community here and I only got 49. That's not the point. The real point is set a goal so that you can strive for it and know ahead of time what it's going to take to get there. And finally, set a date for yourself by which you will measure that. So right now, just talking off the top of your head, when would you like to see that increase in place? Taking into consideration that also this community doesn't um, not everybody uses um, social media and is just getting used to social media and technology, especially since the pandemic, I would probably give, give this, if we're being consistent and I start pushing reels in a consistent pace, maybe about three months, just to kind of get an idea of how that flow is and get that algorithm pushing us out there. Perfect. And again, the point is not that at the end of three months, if you haven't gotten there to be really upset by it, this is so that you have that goal in front of you now. And within those three months, you figure out who do I need to have involved? What platform? Well, we've talked about the platform, but how are we going to use that platform effectively to get there? And if we see that we're not reaching our goal about halfway through when we do a check-in, 
what adjustments do we have to make? Do we need to make it a longer period of time? Do we need to get more people involved in it? But have these in mind to guide the process so it becomes easy and manageable and measurable. Does that make sense, Celeste? Yes, it makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Ezra, what am I missing there? I think I think we discussed a lot. I just don't want to keep hammering people with the same kind of information. Um, and I think, you know, just from the discussions that I see on the, on the chat and how I engage everybody with the discussions, everybody really gets it. And the bottom line also, let's let's be reminded that you need to have funding. You need to have resources for marketing. So in addition to also um, understanding the fact that this is a full-time job and this is a specific skill set that people need to have, not necessarily go post on social media, um, you also need funding. You need people that maybe will ha be hired as consultants or part-timers or maybe even a volunteer program that could run this. But it, it is an effort that needs, um, you know, gu like specific guidelines, because I've also seen specifically in some of the smaller public libraries that this is done on a case by case basis and sometimes kind of like an ad hoc efforts here and there. So there isn't a specific, you know, department that's responsible for social media and marketing. Um, and as I get and as I say, people are like, especially, you know, the younger generation, the teens that are so used to you know, all the, you know, Apple products or whatever products that they're used to, they want to see something that's, you know, highly professional. So we don't want to put something cheesy out there and call it marketing. That's also one thing that I've noticed sometimes. Thank you. Let's go one more round here. Anybody else who wants to run their responses to that exercise? And this time, Esther, why don't you take the lead in commenting on it and leading whatever discussion you want to. But first, let's get a volunteer out there. Who'd sure. like to do this? Okay, I, I think I will talk, um, uh, just from my personal experience, I just realized actually we have developed some kind of fatigue, kind of like social media fatigue. And then specifically is about um, our Zoom meetings, like system wide Zoom meetings. And we have had this since pan pandemic. So it's almost like three years. And then we used to have all the, uh, like every Thursday morning, we will have the Zoom meeting for all staff. And then it was fine at the beginning because the content was kind of, uh, was sort of a fresh. And then in, after three years, and then somehow the, um, the routine is the same. And the content is the same. And then the, the panel is the same. So as a result, I think I just noticed a lot of people have developed that kind of fatigue. And then what you can see, the indication is we will see a lot of comments, like anonymous comments or not even chat. And then the, um, the host will receive all this. I mean, one thing is probably there's some kind of discontent from the staff um, in their daily work. And then the other thing I think I would just realize that might have something to do with the social media, I mean, the Zoom, that kind of model itself. So I just throw out this as one of the examples of the social media tools to see whether uh, anyone will have better idea. And then since we're doing exercise, I will just concentrate on this alone. Uh, I mean, I see what you're talking about. I mean, and I think that's something that, you know, pretty much all organizations are suffering from, from that staff attrition or that great resignation because people are um, I think as we stayed more at home, we recognize that we love our homes and we love working from home sometimes. Um, and that's why a lot of institutions, including my institution, went back to the hybrid model. Uh, a lot of institutions are creating, you know, celebrations programs and ways to kind of, you know, um, 
encourage employee retention rather than employee resignation because we're, we're seeing that great resignation people are like you know what I don't like to do this anymore um, so I think this is more more than just a social media advocacy issue it's more of a an internal um, you know organization uh, you know programs that will keep and retain employees and this can be done I mean what we've done at Chapman is that we've been doing like surveys focus groups to see what people actually genuinely want, because people, I mean, sometimes they don't care about parties and they don't care about those, you know, holiday gifts. Uh, maybe they care more about like, you know, work, work life balance, maybe working from home a couple of days or three days a week. Um, so getting to the nitty gritty of what people really want. Um, again, it will, it's kind of like a top bottom um, approach because it, you have to have a leader that actually believes in this and and is willing to go around and ask people or maybe do an anonymous survey and see what people really really want because you know throwing in a party or two a year sometimes doesn't work for everyone uh, some people actually don't attend these things uh, we all know that in, especially in the library profession people tend to be i don't want to be very stereotypical but a lot of people just prefer their alone time like leave me alone i'm here to do my job and get out of here. So we have a lot of introverts, but that doesn't mean that I'm actually a lot of the introverts that I meet um, are some of the most productive people within our institutions. Uh, but maybe their needs and wants are not the same as the extroverts that like to socialize and join those happy hours. Um, so this is really more than a social media advocacy issue. This is more of a institution F issue. Uh, but but going back to marketing and social media, I think social, like my position as someone uh, that manages the Leatherby Libraries marketing strategy and created it back in 2011, I'm part of the leadership council. So that's one thing I say all the time, the person that's responsible, or at least the responsible of the team that does marketing has to be part of administration because you're in tune of what the community wants to see and you have to really be aware of what's going on and all the decisions to be able to market what's going on in the libraries as well. Um, but but I, I definitely hear you. It's something, it's a phenomenon that pretty much all organ, our organizations are suffering from. Um, and we see resignations for absolutely no reason. If we've had some people really leave their positions for some lower paid positions or sometimes um, you know, the same pay just because they're going to work from home, for example, or it's closer to their families or whatever it is the, the reason, or just a change in scenery sometimes. Um, it, it definitely affected uh, all of us. I mean, we see the mental health crisis within this country, whether in teens and also adults as well. Um, so it's, it's really a bigger issue than, you know, social media advocacy. But thank you for your question. You're bringing up a really good point. And maybe that's a that's an idea for Paul for his next training uh, or, you know, workshop is to, to, to actually think about how libraries across the state are handling the great resignation and, um, you know, staff and employee retention. All right, so now we've got our series planned out. As we draw the end of this, again, we've thrown so much at you and heard so many wonderful things. Um, we both want to wish you the best of luck in following up on what you planned out today and hope this is going to lead you to some really productive things in terms of advocating on behalf of your organization, your community, your colleagues, and the issues that are important to those communities. Quick wrap up here. Let's remember that some of the main themes we covered were the idea that when you're dealing with social media, you want to make sure that the platform you're <coughs> exploring is the one that the audience you want to reach is on. No point in putting all your stuff on Facebook if all your potential advocates and and activists are on TikTok or something else. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Make sure that you are responding to the, the posts that you're seeing out there. Check things like Yelp to see what's being said about your organization, uh, especially if you have a breakoff organization that is specifically an advocacy issue. For example, planning a new main library. You know, if there's something out there where people are responding to that, you need to see what's happening and you need to be responding to that. You need to do it in positive uh, ways. And if you start receiving a lot of online harassment or a lot of 
pushback, think about having other people come in and help you on that. So we hope this has been helpful. We hope you will reach out to us if you have any other questions. We hope you'll share the idea with your colleagues that this is in an archive version now and remains a training available free of charge to the California Library Association. Let us take one last round of questions if you have any. Is there anybody else that has something they wanted to ask that we haven't covered yet? Sounds like everybody's getting ready for lunch. So we will, as soon as we say goodbye, we'll stop the recording. Esther and I will stay for a couple more minutes in case anybody wants to ask something they didn't ask in the recording. And we hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are. Okay, Karen, probably safe to stop the recording.